Welcome to the League of Nations. Let's burn through that. I'm Dax. And I'm Nick. And welcome to the Coal Room. Our non-weekly rugby union chat show. <laughs> yeah, we skipped this week. E Sorry. <laughs> so today, because there's nothing really special happening in world rugby as well, right now. Curry Cup knockouts were pretty impressive. Yeah, extra time semi-final last time. That hasn't happened in a while, but that besides ended. the point. Um, also, shock, Canterbury made it to the Mutri 10 Cup final. <gasps> <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, moving on. Today we're going to be discussing the new proposal from World Rugby Head Honchos about the League of Nations. So, in a nutshell, they want to do a worldwide tournament. Yeah. Uh, you know, something else for New Zealand to win every single game. Yeah, along with the Rugby Championship and the World Cup. Um, that takes place in non-World Cup years. So, proposal was to have the top 12 nations from yeah. the North and South, and they compete in a so year event. The, yeah, the top 12 in the world, six from the Southern Hemisphere, six from the Northern Hemisphere. In, so, obviously this is a very new proposal. Mm -hmm. So. In our heads, we took this to be the top six ranked Southern Hemisphere teams versus mm -hmm. the top six ranked Northern Hemisphere teams, which mm -hmm. doesn't quite work out to be what you'd expect. expect what you'd expect yeah. to see. Um, but we've kind of drawn it up on the board as it stands right now. So, as it stands right now, Nick will represent South. Because, oh, yeah, you know, South is best. And oh. the Southern Hemisphere will consist of New Zealand, who are currently ranked first. South Africa first. Which you spelled wrong. South Africa. <laughs> Australia, Argentina, Fiji, and Tonga, who are ranked 12th. Yeah. And then in the north, no surprises, Ireland, followed by Wales, England, Scotland, France, and surprisingly, Japan. Yeah, um, you might see that we were kind of getting the six nations going here. Italy didn't make the cut. Nope. Um, but these, if the competition were to happen next year, this is right now what would, would be the teams competing. In a nutshell, bar any weird changes in the world rankings in, uh, November. in November, but we kind of broke it down to um, how they worked it out basically is the Six Nations Tournament for the North and the Rugby Championship down here in the South would feature as events, kind of, as part of the tournament. And then they'll change things how they work with our inbound and outbound tours. So our inbound tour is the July, June, July test window, and the outbound tour is the November test window. So essentially, those tournaments would still be happening. You'd still have the rugby championship, you'd still have the Six Nations. But instead, in addition to those tournaments happening, the Six Nations, for example, those would all be within conference games for the Northern Hemisphere mm. as well, uh, where points would contribute to this overall League of Nations. And the Rugby Championship games, I think they would choose one fixture to be mm. the League of Nations fixture, because otherwise it's a bit unfair, considering like six nations, everyone only plays each other once, where as in the Rugby Championship, everyone plays each other twice. Yep. So you might find the first encounter is for League of Nations and then the rest for Rugby Championship. And then with the inbound tour where we would usually well, the New Zealand, South Africa, Australia and Argentina will generally have one team in tour and do three tests. They'll probably have one of maybe Ireland, Wales and England do a round robin for the four nations in terms of the test matches. And then when we go out, we'll do Scotland, France and Japan. Yeah, so again, for example, you might find that Ireland come down in the June international test window and they spend one week in New Zealand, one week in South Africa, one week in Australia. Wales might start in South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and England might go Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. And then in November, obviously the tradition is that the Southern Hemispheres go north. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find like New Zealand might play Scotland, France, and Japan in that kind of November window. Um, and then obviously points will be tallied up, and the top four teams out of the 12, so it's not like top four in the conference, it's a collective top four, from what we understand, mm -hmm. go into a knockout elimination phase, so a semi-final and final stage for them to be crowned the overall best nation in the world for that year. Yeah, the top League of Nations. So, again, this is only non-World Cup years. In a year where there is a World Cup, so 2019 for example, 
this competition would not be taking place. Yeah, this was pro this is a proposal that they're wanting for after the World Cup um, to change things up a little bit because we have the Six Nations and the and the and the Rugby Championships, but it doesn't include a lot of places like, for example, Fiji and Tonga. They're not inclusive. Uh, Japan is not inclusive of any tournaments at the present moment outside of the World Cup unless they do their own uh, inter-island. So there is the Pacific Nations Cup. Yeah. Um, but the that isn't as popular, mm -hmm. and the hope is to also generate more popularity in international rugby rather than focusing on leagues such as like the French Top 14 where um, they're finding uh, they have a situation right now where the French rugby watching public is more interested in watching those games mm. than actually watching international uh, tests with France taking place. Um, I guess the rugby is trying to avert a kind of soccer situation yeah. where clubs hold all the power and international teams don't have any power. Correct. Um, well, in terms of with the top 14 and the and the pro 14. A lot of a lot of the star buying power and all the financing really comes out of it because there are a lot of privately owned clubs. Um, so it is it is difficult for an international rug, for world rugby to compete against that, considering they actually have to share their funds throughout the world. Um, so it's not like one big pool that goes and benefits everyone uh, in club rugby in terms of private ownership. This is. This is a country representation. I mean, yeah. a lot of a lot of it. Um, the leagues themselves fund the national teams, whereas the clubs in France, those are all privately owned or private equities that actually funnel money. I mean, that's why they can pay uh, two million uh, pounds a year for for guys like Dan Carter or four million pounds for uh, Richie McCaw, those type of guys. So something like this. It's probably the shot in the arm that we we kind of need for support for, for all the, the world national teams. And it'll be interesting to see how they get it off the ground. There's also talk that there'd be a second tier mm. for the uh, nations from 13 to 24, um, that they can also compete for something. Um, and then they can also given like, uh, Countries like Germany, for example, who are ranked in the top 20, mm. they don't really feature on the worldwide circuit. Yeah, so and Russia. Something um, like that. Um, and it could also possibly be a promotion relegation situation where you could say the top 10 mm -hmm. in the rankings will always be guaranteed to yeah, one then there's, there's, but then there's a promotion relegation for the bottom teams and the winners. I mean, there's, the, there's sides something. like the USA, there's Canada who, who have really good national teams yeah. that don't really get to compete. There's Namibia. Um, I think Zimbabwe just falls outside of that. So yeah, Zimbabwe will fall just outside that. There's Russia, Romania, who also have teams. Georgia, for example, yeah. who has just putting outside the top 12 uh, rankings as of this. So it'll be interesting and it'll be a really, really nice, a really nice tournament outside of just watching the Six Nations and the Rugby Championship. Speaking of, looking forward to, to the Outbound Tour that starts in um, two weeks. Yes, two we weeks. We play England. Yeah, in, 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 in a non-test uh, match, but we'll go into more detail that next week in the build up to that yeah because um, we want to wait until after the curry cup final so that we can see what the actual final team is uh that's going to be touring the the, the um europe yeah um speaking of just general rugby news um again we kind of mentioned it uh curry cup semi-final between province and the bulls went into extra time yep hasn't happened in recent memory for a no, long not time for um, again, so I mean, we're having the province Bulls games in the last two weeks have really been in like history making games. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, first one being called off because of weather. Yep. Second one going into extra time. It's just like weird, yep. weird theory. things. Um, Sharks destroying a star studded uh, Golden Lions team. Yeah, they, the Lions just somehow couldn't keep up. But that was my kind of prediction. I predicted a province Sharks final. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'll be keen for that. So yeah. I'll watch that. Rematch from last year for both teams. Yeah. So we beat them at the Shark Tank last year. Um, they're hoping to upset the apple cart this side. Yeah, at Newlands. And this might possibly be one of the last games at Newlands. Yep. Um, given that it's now official that Cape Town Stadium will now be the future home of Stormers and Province. I think after uh, from next year, I think. Either next year or, or the year after. Yeah. But uh, the deal's still being negotiated. <laughs> we'll let you know if that happens. When that happens, it is happening. If it happens, it's happening. <laughs> well, it's the Western Cape government, so you never know. 
The finances say that it's cheaper for Western Province Rugby to rent a mm -hmm. stadium than to manage their yeah. stadium that they own. So apparently that is the justification for the move outside of Newlands and given that they've had such financial troubles over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. it does make sense. That's fair. But uh, I think that's, that's a wrap for us this week. Um, not much news wise. I will say I did read a very, very interesting comment today uh, talking about the, the five points or takeaways from the Curry Cup. Um, I'm not going to say who the user was, but he basically said, why are we getting all the news about black rugby players when white players are just talent, just as talented and just as good? Um, I'll tell you why. Uh, we're in a transformative Interesting. Rugby, opinion, uh, rugby state at the present moment. And um, we've got a hundred years of highlighting the really good white rugby players. I think maybe it's time for the black players like Sabu Corsi, Apio Diante, um, Damien Willemse, um, your uh, Bulls uh, fly off whose name escapes me at the present moment. Money Lubok. Money Lubok. Great players of colour. And they actually need to be pointed out, to be quite honest. And, you know, like rugby is supposed to be an inclusive sport. And if we can highlight some really, really great players of colour, coming into into the ranks, then yeah, I'm all for that type of journalistic uh, approach. So that's my rant for the day. Your <laughs> product brought to you by The Amazing Spider-Man. The Amazing Spider-Man. But anyway, cheers guys, thanks so much for watching. Yeah, like the video, leave your comments on what you think about the possible League of Nations. Again, it's a possibility. And there's no certainty, it's a proposal. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, subscribe if you haven't already. And hit the bell icon so that we can notify you with new videos. And we'll see you next week where we hopefully get to uh, see what the new Springbok squad is. Maybe, maybe next week. I mean, we're not really living up to this next week kind of thing. But Well, we'll see. Bye, guys. Cheers.